our community meetings uh, and we are pleased that uh, Supervisor Damon Connolly is here once again and he is uh, going to update us on matters from the county's perspective and with particular focus on our Point San Pedro Road area. Uh, Supervisor Connolly, welcome. Thank you, Bonnie. So I need to have my video enabled if the host can do that. Ah, there we go. I'm sure our uh, webmaster- You should be able to our... start your video yourself. Uh, no, it's saying I cannot start because oh, of the host. Oh no, our first <laughs> technical glitch. Okay, so, well, yeah. <laughs> our, our webmaster is uh, our, our maestro behind the scenes here and has been working hard to get this uh, program. There we go. Yeah. Right. So thank, thank you, you Alan, thank for, you. for getting this in. We really appreciate it. And welcome once again, Supervisor Colin. Absolutely. And thank you, uh, Bonnie, Denise, Alan, the Point San Pedro Road crew. Uh, certainly one of the best uh, neighborhood associations, I think, in the county. It's always great to work with you uh, and be back at the annual meeting. Um, it looks like we have some great attendance. As always, I'm, I'm kind of picturing in my mind our usual setting uh, there at the church uh, with a great view in the background, but uh, we'll go with Zoom for this year. So, um, a lot is going on at the county, and I'd like to provide um, a background on some things of key interest uh, to your neighborhoods along Point San Pedro Road, uh, open it up to a broader discussion. And as always, uh, the key part is, is hearing your questions and your ideas uh, and concerns. So again, thank you to the coalition for having me here. Uh, I want to first take a moment to recognize some extraordinary work uh, that happened this week, uh, namely uh, between uh, your Point San Pedro Road Coalition and the San Rafael Rock Quarry. As you may be aware, uh, a big recent issue was the quarry's application to extend their mining operations by 20 years, from 2024 to 2044. And as part of the permitting and requirements around that, uh, it required an evaluation of their reclamation plan, which is looking forward, uh, how does that area look once quarry operations cease and what are the environmental impacts uh, and the like of that? Uh, so a couple of key issues emerged and what was again, noteworthy and extraordinary was the level of dialogue that occurred, uh, partnership, if you will, uh, and resolution of some key uh, issues. Uh, the ones that really rose to the top are things like air quality in the neighborhood, making sure that that continues to be monitored and regulated uh, as necessary. Uh, and also looking a little bit forward, uh, restoration of the marsh area. Uh, around the quarry and how that's going to look in ensuing years. And of course, real bread and butter things like the quality of the road, uh, which we know 
uh, as part of quarry operations, it's important to monitor that and make sure that the road is up to standards for uh, everyone who use it, uses it in the years forward. Uh, so uh, just a couple of highlights that emerged on air quality monitoring. Uh, the quarry has agreed uh, in working with the county to develop a plan uh, that would determine uh, when compliant air monitoring and testing uh, will occur. And again, the key there is going to be to stay on top of that issue, uh, make sure that there are no adverse air quality issues uh, going forward. On marsh restoration, the quarry has agreed to engage an expert uh, for a second opinion to provide advice on updating the restoration plan uh, consistent with current technology and practices. Again, this originally was a plan that was uh, drafted, boy, about uh, 15 years ago or thereabouts, uh, certainly over 10 years. So it does need to be updated. And that's another thing that will be uh, looked at. And then finally, on road repaving, uh, discussions are ongoing uh, on that score, uh, and we'll stay uh, closely on top of it. So I want to also, uh, and, and again, thank you to all the parties uh, for, for really stepping up. Um, and I, I was happy to play a, a relatively minor role in those discussions as well. I want to take a moment to highlight some of the work happening along Point San Pedro Road and touch also on a hot topic right now uh, for all of our communities, and that is redistricting uh, before opening up for questions. So uh, as you may know, Bayside Park uh, along the road is currently uh, open, uh, but the work is not complete. Uh, we still need to add turf once drought conditions improve. So what you see there, albeit I think it looks pretty sharp, uh, is not the final product. Uh, the park was identified as needing accessibility improvements. Uh, some of the issues flagged were uprooted asphalt, a tripping hazard, steep slope that was not wheelchair accessible, degraded asphalt, and narrow pathways. Uh, to complete the work, uh, we, being the county, were required to follow uh, BCDC permit conditions. Uh, that's a regional agency that governs uh, the Bay shoreline. So that includes adhering to a provision to add a bike lane along Point San Pedro Road uh, through that stretch. Over the summer, the coalition hosted a community forum to discuss salute options on how to address the BCDC permit requirement. That includes exploring uh, an option because what we heard is um, in addition to the bike lane, there still is some interest in maintaining parking, dedicated parking uh, adjacent to the park on Point San Pedro Road. To accommodate parking and the bike lane, an idea that emerged would be to actually do uh, what is being called a lane diet, um, essentially reducing Point San Pedro Road during that, through that stretch from two lanes down to one lane. We heard loud and clear that the community wants to retain parking, as I mentioned. Um, with regard to the lane diet, we know there were mixed opinions. Uh, so we're going to, uh, the plan at least, is to explore the idea of a pilot project on, uh, through a community forum that we're hoping to have by the end of this calendar year. So keep an eye out for that, uh, most likely in mid-December, uh, to delve deeper into the issue. So again, fully recognizing um, mixed opinions right now. Uh, I see a couple of possible uh, positives from it. One being, of course, if the true community truly wants to retain parking in addition to the required bike lane, that's the way to do it. Secondly, what we've seen in other areas where similar uh, traffic calming measures have been put in place is there is a safety improvement. For example, where I live uh, in North San Rafael, 
Uh, the same thing was done many years ago along Las Galinas Avenue, which is a main thoroughfare as well, uh, where it started with two lanes, was reduced to one. There's plenty of room for parking, bike lane, speeds kind of reduced, no appreciable difference in traffic in terms of congestion. That's something that would need to be studied, obviously, to see the actual effects of it. And I think if you ask folks around that area, they would never go back uh, to the prior. So there's a lot of things to unpack, a lot of things to look at in terms of actual traffic impacts. Uh, but I think it is a pilot uh, project uh, waiting to happen in the sense of let's see uh, if that can actually improve things out there. So as I mentioned, I wanted to um, uh, talk about redistricting because that's catching a lot of people's attention right now. And of course, that's by virtue of every 10 years uh, throughout the nation and, and going all the way to our local county supervisor districts and everything in between, uh, district lines are looked at based on census numbers, which are updated every 10 years. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of potential changes, uh, particularly in the congressional and assembly districts. You've probably been reading about that. And by the way, we're encouraging folks to speak up uh, as you uh, see fit, uh, if you have some opinions on that. Uh, in the latest round of drafts on the assembly district, for example, uh, we're, we are actually seeing Marin County split into two districts, uh, which uh, obviously we would push back on and are uh, because Marin County is really a, a area, a community of interest is the term they use. Uh, so the congressional districts, similarly, they're looking at a lot of different things that would effectively uh, result in perhaps um, not having a strong representation, uh, again, for our community of interest, which is our whole county. So I think it's something to pay attention to. Uh, a lot of us are, and I'm sure there will be more to come in that the final maps are not due until toward the end of December. So there'll be a lot of uh, probably commentary and, and changes even in the uh, interim on that. So again, what does this all mean? We won't know until the final map is adopted, uh, but be rest assured, uh, I will continue to advocate to keep communities of interest together. You may also want to tune in to our local uh, level. Um, our county supervisor maps are being looked at right now. And the next hearing on that will be this Tuesday at our board of supervisors meeting. Uh, so um, a lot of ideas coming forward. And again, the goal is to make sure uh, that there's very strong representation uh, for everyone, including your neighborhood. So again, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, I wanna thank in particular, Bonnie, Denise, Alan, Dave, Kevin, Winifred, and the whole coalition team for an outstanding event and for inviting me. Um, I'm prepared to talk about a range of additional issues we are working on. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's exceptionally busy right now, COVID, uh, climate change, wildfire prevention, housing, homelessness, uh, and transportation, to name a few of the topics that I spend my days on. Uh, but why don't we stop here and open it up to Q&A. Let me know what is on your mind. Uh, and then we can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. This is Denise. Just everyone know we have eight minutes for Q&A. So the first question I have for you, um, I'm trying to synthesize it. It's rather long uh, writing, but this person was really upset by the editorial that Damon and Kate, Conley Mayor Kate, wrote in the IJ this past week about the Smart Train Board listening to the passengers. She said it's, uh, she wrote both of you uh, about her concerns about not listening to the Marin community who are all impacted by the smart train tracks running basically through town, um, backing up traffic and causing pollution and blood pressure <laughs> rises. Um, bottom line, the question is basically, during Alboro's time as mayor, 
on a smart board, you said it was too costly to put overhead tracks. Maybe now that clean air initiative is at the top of the headlines, they can find the dollars to fund the overhead tracks. Uh, any comment with regard to that? So I uh, really appreciate that. And I did receive that email, I believe yesterday. So thank you uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, you know, we're all uh, very aware of the idea that smart by running through town um, has impact. So how do we minimize those? Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that uh, have been implemented. Um, Personally, I, I am not seeing as much uh, traffic as a result of that as, it, as previously, uh, but would love your input. We've got to stay on top of it. So there's a few things going on. Making sure that uh, signalization is synchronized, of course, uh, for a while it seemed like just unnecessarily sitting behind a series of, of lights as the train rolled through. Um, a big ticket item is that we're looking at is actually relocating uh, the downtown Santa Fe Transit Center. I think that uh, could potentially be a game changer in terms of helping mobility through that area. Right now, uh, it's not even just the smart uh, train issue. It's there's a lot of pedestrian uh, safety issues right around there just with the current configuration let alone the fact that because SMART now bisects the existing location, it's very cramped uh, and actually um, ultimately needs to even be uh, changed even to, to operate uh, existing transit services out there. So there's been a big community process uh, that's ongoing, um, looking at a couple of different options uh, to move that slightly, uh, from its current location. And I think that among other things um, can improve circulation around that whole area. The idea of an overhead uh, track has been raised in the past. It, it uh, certainly uh, is an interesting idea. Uh, my sense from what I've heard, exceptionally expensive. Uh, so the cost bottom line would need to be looked at, but um, I've heard that uh, idea often. And obviously, I'm always open to any ideas that um, from a benefit cost standpoint, are feasible. Um, overall, of course, traffic is, is coming back. Uh, we're aware of that. Numbers are down in terms of the number of people driving or commuting, if you will. Um, a lot of people are still working from home. But where you're feeling the traffic come back is even though those numbers are down, public transit usage is down still. So you're getting congestion back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of and, and we need to continue to address. I think I heard the bell. Uh, next question, uh, with Bayside Park, the lack of shade trees is not satisfactory to many who have expressed opinions. Planting turf will not solve this. What are you doing to increase shade in the park? Why has no one from the disabled community at Marin Center for Independent Living been asked if the results of the rebuilding is working for them? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that the last part is true, but certainly uh, members of the uh, community uh, should be uh, absolutely asked. So that's something I can follow up on. Um, and I have a great relationship uh, with the Marin Center for Independent Living. Um, I was made aware that the, there will at least be a parking spot for the uh, disabled uh, that will remain. Um, so that's one issue. On shade trees, yeah, I think, um, you know, landscaping is not completed. So um, all ideas are welcome on that. And again, I think this was just kind of a first step. Uh, so uh, more is coming on the landscaping front. But I have heard in particular the issue of the trees. Uh, so that's something that I'm, I'm staying on top of. Thank you. The one comment that was put in was rather terse, uh, which was transportation update. So I'll let you kind of pick on that as you like. But from my point of view, I would think uh, what is 
being done to improve general public transportation uh, through the county? Yeah, so I, I, I started down that road, so thank you, and I'll, I'll just complete a few thoughts. So really, the issue is, and, and a lot of this is in flux, we're going to see how many people continue to work from home, um, how people are getting to work, it could change uh, to some extent. Uh, that having been said, there are some fundamentals coming into place, and that is that um, because public transit use is now still down, um, that congestion is coming back. So uh, there is going to be a role for public transit going forward, how that looks, how it's organized. Um, those are kind of the bigger issues right now, but it is going to be needed, and I think we need to start planning for that. Uh, right now. So the San Rafael Transit uh, Center is one of those issues. We're getting a lot of feedback now from folks who want to see um, certain routes through Golden Gate Transit come back um, uh, to get people uh, to their jobs. One thing we saw loud and clear through the pandemic is there is a core group of riders that never left transit. Those are um, what are called transit dependent riders um, who use transit um, as their primary means of, communicate, or of transportation, as well as essential workers. Uh, so what you saw is that local transit continued to be used extensively where numbers were down were things like the ferry, uh, smart train and regional bus systems. So I think getting ridership back to that latter category, making sure the systems are what they need to be to attract uh, that ridership. We're looking at a regional um, approach called seamless mobility, uh, making sure that all the systems work together uh, to, again, make sure that uh, it's, a, it's an effective and useful alternative uh, for people. So that's one of my main areas that I work on as your Metropolitan Transportation Commission uh, member representing all of our Marin cities and towns. Uh, and I think you're gonna see some interesting things come out of that. Thank you very much. I think uh, we uh, learned a lot and we appreciate you taking the time to answer so many questions. Um, we appreciate you as always coming and joining us for this community meeting. So. Um, Supervisor Connolly, uh, our gratitude. Thank um, you. Um, our next uh, speaker is our new San Rafael Police Chief, uh, David Spiller. And uh, Chief Spiller is going to give us some information about not just uh, being the new police chief, he's going to be telling us a little bit about himself uh, and some issues uh, he's going to address are ones that are important to us here on the Point San Pedro Road Peninsula. I want to welcome him here today and thank him for joining us. Chief Good Spiller, morning. take it thank from you, here. Bonnie. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'm super grateful to share my portion of this morning's meeting with Supervisor Connolly and Director Judice. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged by the invitation. I'm, I'm grateful to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you this morning, share a little bit about myself, a little bit about the organization as I come in now six months into my uh, tenure here in the San Rafael Police Department and kind of talk about not only uh, me, what I represent um, as your police chief, but also uh, kind of what's important and what's happening as we move forward in the organization. So uh, let me just start off by saying thank you for having me. Uh, as a new resident of the community, new to the community, new to the organization, um, I, I am super appreciative for what exists here in San Rafael. This is a very supportive community. It's a top-notch organization that's consistently focused forward and innovative and uh, problem solving and its approach uh, to many different issues. But uh, having spent over 30 years, 33 years now in law enforcement, I walked into this organization uh, and found myself very warmly welcomed and uh, really impressed by the caliber of, of the people, not only the men and women within the police department, but the uh, city staff and the department head team that represents 
uh, the organization to serve this community is really top notch. So uh, I feel very privileged and honored as uh, I transition yet again in my uh, uh, law enforcement career. Um, so I do feel, I feel very privileged to be your, your chief and to lead the men and women of this organization here in San Rafael. My commitment to you, my commitment as the leader of this uh, police department is to serve the members of the San Rafael community with, uh, with honor and with respect and with compassion. I think dignity and respect is something that absolutely everybody deserves and that's what we strive to deliver in all of our contacts with uh, members of the community. I often make reference to, uh, you know, as your police department, uh, the city organization, you know, we are subordinate to you. We work to accomplish uh, goals that are set out by the council who represents you and, and to serve uh, and to do it the right way. And I've often said to my staff and my students, I'm also a college professor, is to do it right, we have to do it the way the community wants it and the, the larger conversation of what's happening in the community. So uh, what we have here is really, really a good thing. So I represent, as I mentioned, I've represented over um, five different police departments in 30 years of, over 30 years of law enforcement. I'm a Bay Area native. I was born and raised in Cupertino, California. Uh, went to school there, started uh, my law enforcement journey as a young cadet police assistant in Mountain View before I headed down to Southern California where I went to the police academy in San Diego. A few years there brought me back home. Uh, an opportunity came up at, back in Mountain View. I was a police officer there for just under 12 years, about 11 and a half years or so, where I had a lot of different uh, experiences and opportunities to really develop as a police officer, police supervisor, uh, including uh, labor union leadership, um, special events management. I ran Shoreline Amphitheater for a lot of years, so a lot of different uh, experiences. Um, ultimately, as my career path continued to um, unfold, I had the opportunity to transition to Pleasanton Police Department, where I started as an administrative lieutenant. I worked uh, administration, budget, fleet, facility management, those types of things as a mid manager, and then was quickly promoted to the uh, position of police captain, which is the number two uh, in an organization that size, in an organization similar to the size of San Rafael. Uh, as a captain for nine years, I had the opportunity to work with both the patrol division and the support division, which are the two divisions within a, a typical municipal organization and have a lot of experience kind of managing and leading uh, the leadership within the organization. In uh, 2011, I had the opportunity to become Pleasanton's sixth police chief. So I'm now in my 10th year as a police chief. Uh, I left Pleasanton in 2019. Uh, my life map had uh, an intended course. Uh, COVID and some other personal issues kind of derailed that. And I found myself with an uh, a unique opportunity to return. Uh, I had uh, been invited to be the interim chief in Menlo Park uh, and support that police chief's recruitment in between uh, their their police chief um, uh, uh, their police chiefs. And uh, then I had the opportunity to compete for the San Rafael position, and that's what brings me here. So it's just over six months, seven months now since I've been here, and I have to say, as I mentioned earlier just super pleased with uh, what is going on here in this community and what lies ahead. You know, I will talk a little bit about challenges and uh, what lies ahead in the police profession and also what's, uh, you know, what our, our challenges are here in the city of San Rafael. As I um, progress through my career, my collegiate educate, my collegiate experiences, my education, uh, you know, I, I have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, but my, my master's work was in public sector leadership. And I continue to see myself as a student of leadership. And one of the things that I found in my experience uh, in all these years of law enforcement is the, is the shift of uh, the generation in the workforce. Uh, those that were around before me, those that trained me, those that brought me up in the organization, these generations continue to change. And uh, the motivations and the, um, the things that excite young workers, the things that can connect young workers to the work they've chosen to do uh, continues to change. So this shift in the workforce 
and this divergence of generations, um, it, it really allows me to leverage these uh, leadership experiences that I have. So if you were to ask me, you have it, but if you were to ask me, uh, what is leadership? And in a, current, in, a, in a current contemporary law enforcement organization and a municipal police department, I would describe effective leadership as an influence-based relationship among collaborators who want to create change, who want to make things better, who want to work to uh, improve uh, what's happening. And I think that allows this new generation, their voice to uh, say how they feel and to, to contribute to, to the change that we're realizing. Uh, and I, I find that is a great deal of what we're spending time with as this organization, which is a young organization. We've had a lot of turnover, a lot of new hires, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to leverage the energy and leverage the uh, innovation that, that we have coupled with the traditional disciplines of some of the more senior people. So anyway, in my current role, I serve at the pleasure of the city manager and the city council to execute the uh, initiatives that they have set forth. Uh, but I'm eager. I'm eager to work with the community. I'm eager to take on the challenges that exist. And as your police chief, uh, you know, I'm committed to professionalism. I'm committed to accountability and I'm committed to compassion. And I think that is the touch point between, uh, I, I would argue that uh, law enforcement is the most visible form of local government, those black and white police cars driving around, those frontline responders to calls for service or critical incidents, uh, that touch point of compassion and uh, dignity and respect is really critical as we deliver our service. I, uh, as I look forward, the vision that I've set for the organization, not so much a destination, but like a, how I'd like to see us uh, continuing to improve. My vision is set on four things. It's working together, you know, law enforcement is kind of the ultimate team sport. We rely on one another for, um, you know, for support, for managing critical calls, and even I, I won't, I will suggest not so insignificantly the support that we show one another uh, with that critical um, cumulative trauma that we realize and seeing some sometimes nasty things in this career. Number two, pride and professionalism, remembering that. Uh, what we do is an, a noble profession. It's a calling and just pulling on that pride and the professionalism as a contemporary law enforcement officer and what we represent. Uh, number three is our focus of service, our calling to serve, our calling to be subordinate to the community and, and, uh, and work with the community to get it and to get it right. Uh, that, that service ethic has to be, uh, we have to recall that our why, why we came to do this, whether it was 30 years ago or five years ago, what was it that brought us to this? And just recall that, that, that service ethic, that calling that brought us. And last but not least, that fourth element of my vision is that focus on the future, our succession. What's next for each of us in our professional career and what's next for the organization as we serve the community. So I think my vision, those elements, uh, take what is a good organization to a really, really great organization. Uh, with that, I'll just cite really quickly, because I heard a bell, uh, the issues that we're realizing in the community, obviously, uh, traffic, 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 those are always like the top three, but certainly mental health issues, homelessness um, uh, um, are, are critical issues that we're spending a lot of time with, not only our organizations, but our, our allied agency partners and the county and nonprofits, we, we spend a lot of time and energy to resource uh, those residents that are experiencing homelessness and work to a positive uh, end. Uh, also, building trust in relationships. It's a nonstop uh, responsibility of the organization to continue to invest in the relationship between the police and the community so we can deepen that trust. And then I would offer uh, another issue that we're working with is res building resiliency and health and wellness for our public safety staff. It's a stressful career with people who have significant commutes and the cumulative trauma of what people see and, um, you know, the, it's not always the healthiest profession. So really investing in our people to make sure that they're taking care of themselves and that we're taking care of one another. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave uh, the rest of my time, I guess, to Q&A. But uh, again, let me just finish by saying thank you. I think it's, this is a great uh, or this is a great group in the community. And uh, to be able to have some time with you this Saturday morning is uh, not only to introduce myself, but to talk about what's happening in the organization. I'm eager to answer whatever questions you have. Uh, but I'm grateful for your uh, time and attention this morning. 
Thank you, Chief. Um, a few questions, some of them uh, that I got offline. One is, uh, says, thank you, Chief, and welcome. I really like your definition of contemporary leadership. Would you please write that out for me? I think maybe in a, a, an article or whatever in the IJ or something uh, of that nature. I'm not sure what he meant by write that out. Yeah, so uh, I could share that. I, you know, it's funny. I, in my study of leadership, there's, I don't know, there's probably no less than 300, 400 definitions or philosophies around leadership. This one I really kind of draw on, his name is Joseph Rost, R-O-S-T. He's a, he's a, a, a leadership author, uh, but it's that, that the emphasis of, of influence, because as a leader, that's, you know, it's inspiration and influence that we balance to really impact and motivate people. So that influence and building relationships so we can draw on one another and kind of create more uh, out of us than what we have out of just our individual. Uh, and then that collaboration, really working uh, to collaborate and improve things. So that, that my philosophy really is kind of broken out of parts of Joseph Rost, Joseph Rost's philosophy on leadership. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. I'm, by the way, I wanna encourage uh, our attendees, if you have questions to ask, please use the Q&A function and uh, uh, provide it. I'll try to read them out. Uh, question on staffing level. Uh, what are you finding to be the staffing level of uh, police on the street, so to speak? And has that been affected by uh, any officers um, refusing to be vaccinated? Mm, good question. So um, staffing, if you were to ask any of the 336 police chiefs in the state of California, what would you like? They would all say more cops. Uh, you know, and staffing really is a critical issue because what we are, that's our product, all right? Our product is service. And we need staff to be out there to do it. And everybody in every part of our community has real needs. And our goal is, you know, our goal as a public safety organization to deliver safety, service, and uh, improve quality of life and reduce crime. You know, we need to be out there. We need to be on patrol. We need to be responding to calls for service. And we need to minimize those emergency response times. And we need to have thorough follow-up investigations so we can clear cases. All of these things are important. So to do it all, we need more staff what we do is we take what we have and we kind of play the chess games, right? If we want to increase the, the clearance rates and the investigations, then we move some more resources into investigations. If we want to, you know, quick uh, stop those uh, emergency calls for service and minimize that response time, we move more resources into patrol. But there's a balance to all of this. Uh, our staffing level. So we have 76 sworn staff members plus paraprofessionals like dispatchers and uh, office aides and things like that. I, I um, I think we're a lean organization. I think we can use more cops, but what we do is we endeavor to use our resources as responsibly as we can to meet the balance on all of our goals and initiatives. And um, uh, you know, the, the 76 sworn officers that we have are split between patrol and investigations. And within the patrol division, we have two dedicated traffic officers plus um, you know, six to eight uh, officers per shift on a 24-7, 365. So it only goes so far, but our work to balance uh, those resources, manage calls for service and facilitate problem solving in the field. That's our, that's what we take on. And, and myself, the patrol division commander and the watch commander lieutenants, uh, we consistently monitor activities and what's going on to, to strike that balance. COVID, I, I, I forgot the last part. Um, one of the challenges, it's not, it's not even really COVID related. We've had some COVID um, exposures and issues, but um, our, our number of non-vaccinated um, em employees is, is insignificant. It's, it's very, very small. Um, but a challenge that we do face in this organization and a challenge that we do face in the law enforcement profession in California is uh, injuries and, you know, workers' comp. And, you know, of those 76 Officers that we have here, I think today, seven of them are injured and un unable to work. So that even that, that cuts us even thinner in terms of uh, uh, resourcing. Um, what kind of plans are in place to assure that our police treat all members of our community, especially the BIPOC community, equally? 
So diversity, uh, equity, inclusion are just foundational principles of what we're doing in the management of this organization. From conversations we have at the director team level to conversations we're having for line officers in, uh, you know, in the patrol division and everywhere in between, right? So when we engage in, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, implicit bias training, and we talk about, uh, you know, diversity and those opportunities to really recognize uh, what biases we do carry around and, and avoiding bias-based policing. These are all things that are really critically important. And, you know, we have to continue to check ourselves. We have to continue to expose ourselves to new and contemporary uh, training that in law enforcement 10 years ago, 20 years ago, certainly 30 years ago, we weren't having these conversations. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the, the concerns for social equity and how we uh, provide police services and how we police is really critically important and you know we got to get it right. Uh, welcome chief. I was shocked by the gang violence that appears to involve people from outside Marin, especially that horrible homicide episode er earlier this year. Can San Rafael Police Department handle this? Yes. So we leverage relationships with our allied agencies. We have a great relationship with the sheriff's department and other allied agencies in the county, as well as the region. Uh, my former life as a police chief, I had this unique thing, 58680, that went right through the middle of my jurisdiction. And, you know, crime knows no boundaries and bad guys know no boundaries. Excuse me using the term bad guys. But sometimes, you know, would-be criminals go to different affluent communities to, uh, to do their thing. And we have uh, Richmond San Rafael Bridge, we have the Highway 101 corridor, and these, these create uh, uh, an impact to the transiency, transient nature of crime and um, you know, the, uh, the, the criminal element. So can we handle it? We can. We're very, very well trained. I'd love to have a few more staff, but I'll stop saying that. Uh, but yeah, no, we can handle it. We are, are knee deep in the investigation that was alluded to. Uh, we're continuing to work that case. Um, the activity that takes place uh, from a gang perspective, we work proactively to identify those individuals and their associates where in town they're um, uh, affiliated with. And then, um, you know, we do find that a lot of the uh, suspects that we arrest aren't from San Rafael. Uh, so when you talk about crime and, you know, what kind of crime is taking place, not all of the arrestees that we arrest in town live in town. So this, this transient nature of, of criminalism and crime activity is impacted by things like transportation corridors and that type of thing. So yeah, we, we do sometimes see a lot of out of town arrestees and, and we do our best to, th to thwart and suppress that crime activity. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, a, a brief comment from someone and then one last question, I think, before we move on. Uh, thank you and your force for the empathy you, you show towards all the members of uh, our community. Many of your police force have been local boys and have, who have become great officers. Um, the question I have here is there's evidence a train or two crossing town every weekday at about 5.15 p.m., which regularly backs up westbound traffic way past the high school. This represents at least a 15-minute delay, gridlock access in all directions, as well as access to adjacent shopping centers. What can be done to reduce these delays during the peak traffic volume times? Yeah, so I think, you know, when we talk about traffic, um, when we in law enforcement talk about traffic, it's kind of the three E's, right? It's education, enforcement, and engineering. And engineering is so critical. Uh, Supervisor Connolly made reference to the smart train and some of the potential improvements that people have, have talked about and how it's impacting downtown and the other, uh, the other impacts throughout the community. Um, yeah, it's, we have to educate our community. We have to be patient. And then we have to continue to focus on the, the, uh, the engineering potential that can minimize some of this. Um, but, you know, we're also out there to provide that education and that enforcement. Uh, you know, the gridlock issue where people are blocking intersections because they can't get through that light, that's a real issue. It's not only a real issue for, you know, whoever's behind that person or trying to get through the intersection in the opposite direction, but it's an impact to uh, public safety. You know, if you have to get a, a fire, a piece of fire apparatus through there or an ambulance through there or 
you know, an emergency police vehicle through there, it really is an impact. So all of this is a concern, it's real, it's on our radar. We continue to work with the traffic engineer, we continue to work with the county and other, uh, other entities to try to minimize these impacts. Thank you, Chief. Bonnie? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Very much appreciate your um, comments. Um, excited to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. And I uh, hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker today is our new Community Development Director, Alice. I'm oh, sorry to say Alicia, but she goes by Ali. Good to see. You, and we want to welcome her. Um, attendees at these meetings uh, may recall that we had um, at our last meeting, uh, her predecessor, Paul Jensen, who we honored, he's been uh, a great uh, community development director for years. And um, so she's got big shoes to fill and um, we're excited to uh, learn a little bit about her and have her meet our community and see what she's up to and uh, be able to ask some questions of her. So we really wanna thank her for being here today and welcome Ali. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, and uh, great job, Chief. I, that's kind of a really hard um, presentation to follow. Um, I really um, appreciate hearing specifically the information about leadership. I, I think I wholeheartedly believe in that. And um, so I'll try to give as great of a presentation, but I, I feel like I will, well, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> so I wanted to start with just kind of how I got into government in the first place. Um, my early aspirations were actually, I mentioned this to Bonnie before, um, my early aspirations was working with uh, people with disabilities. And for a number of reasons, um, I ended up choosing city planning um, and, and applied to Cal Poly. I attended Cal Poly um, in their city and regional planning program. At the time, planning, um, the, the Cal Poly was one of the uh, two only programs that were accredited in the state. The, the other one was Berkeley. The way we were different is Berkeley was more focused on policy um, and Cal Poly is, was more focused on hands-on, the, basically the complete program, which included things like um, natural resources and environmental studies, regional planning and the need for coordination amongst different government organizations, um, we also were required to take architectural and site design, which was, I'll admit, my weakness. Um, and then we went into more real government type of, um, of uh, semesters, which included fiscal impacts analysis, land use law, and that sort of thing. Um, the, the program really prepares um, candidates to enter into either public or private sector. I actually went in different directions at different um, times in my career. Um, and ultimately I was also always kind of drawn to this idea that, you know, initially was part of my um, desire was to help people. And it was easy for me to see that the program and that um, my role in, in city planning would be to be a public servant and help people maneuver the land use process. And that means, that means to me is, you know, helping the homeowner understand how to get from point A to point B, um, helping property owners understand, you know, when a development is being proposed, how to participate in the process and effectively participate in the process, and then how to help the development community understand the needs of the community and really implement um, uh, elements in their project so that they are um, really addressing the needs. So I started um, early part of my career. I started as an intern in the city of San Rafael and then later on um, had a job with San Rafael as a planning technician. I then moved to the, to the county of Marin and then did some consulting work um, for a while um, and including some consulting work with the city of San Rafael on and off. And then in 2018, I took on a permanent position with the city. Um, I chose to stay on after doing some consulting work because I found that there were, um, our leadership team um, were so committed to public service and it, it's a rare, it's a rarity. Um, you, see, you see public servants you see that commitment in other organizations, but not the full, like we have a complete 
um, management team that is here because they really care and and you know the philosophy aligned with mine and I just thought this was the right place for me so that is why I've stayed and um, I wanted to share a fun fact um, I actually lived on Surfwood Circle for about three a little over three years so I'm very familiar with some of the issues that um, that you are dealing with. I very specifically remember the early morning um, trucks rumbling down San Pedro heading towards the rock quarry. And, you know, at the time um, we didn't have the paved roads. It was really more of the bumpy roads. So you could hear the, the trailers kind of like rumbling through um, and just really appreciated the Sunday, the Saturday mornings when I could just go out on the deck and just enjoy a cup of coffee without hearing all that. Um, you know, ongoing rumbling. I also remember turning in onto Main Street and just kind of like with a just holding my breath because at the time the landscape um, median was, it had shrubs. I want to say maybe juniper shrubs um, and and always like looking to see if there was a car because there was a lot of speeding, I, I admit. And so it was, I, I can feel that pain for sure. I remember visiting Bruno's and the little video store that always, for some reason, had the most recent um, current movies. And, um, you know, that's where we went for videos. Um, so going into so that's that's a little bit about me. I wanted to just briefly talk about some major projects that are happening throughout the city, um, specifically starting with Loch Lomond. Um, we have had um, there's been kind of a a, what has felt like a pause in um, the development, uh, you know, the continued development of the Loch Lomond. We have, I did want to mention, we have some single family homes that have been, um, applications have been submitted, we're, are currently under review. We have four units of the townhomes. There's, I think, about three different phases of townhomes that are still uh, remaining. And those, we have the first set that have been submitted for review at this time. You may may or may not know that there were six affordable housing units that were um, um, slated for um, development on the Loch Lomond site. Um, those six units, the applicant chose to um, or requested a buyout of those units um, late 2019 and the city council approved those, that buyout. So that means that approximately $3.6 million were deposited into the our affordable housing trust fund. What happens with that is that we will, that, that allows us to um, um, release money for affordable housing projects that could use portions that, of that funding to leverage additional funding from the state and um, make a project, an affordable housing project successful. We're about to release a notice of funding availability um, in the coming months and actually may possibly weeks. Um, and right now we only have one project that we see may take advantage of that. Vivalon is a senior housing project on, um, on Third Street that um, is, is seeking funding from different sources and we may see an application from them. But the, what the notice of funding availability would be a broad, um, a broad net and um, may involve a number of types of units or uh, projects that may apply. Um, going back to Loch Lomond, um, we do have a uh, ongoing application for the Harbor Master, what used to be the Harbor Master building. There's a commercial building there. Um, I haven't seen any revisions yet. Um, and then going on to, before I go on to other projects around the city, um, I did want to mention that we have a housing element that we have kicked off. Um, we just had a kickoff meeting on the 4th. Um, so happy to inform that we have now housing staff that will be um, actively pursuing not only that, but um, also a number of other you know, um, housing related um, solutions. And so I'm super happy to have Jacob Noonan has joined us and then Alexis Captanian, who is a housing analyst has joined us. So they will be managing that 
Um, I encourage anybody who is interested in receiving more information about the housing element to either email um, housing at sanrafel.org um, or you can visit our website at sanrafelhousing.org and that'll um, provide you, you know, get you into a website that will provide information. Um, we'll be uploading documents and um, information on how to participate in the process. We're also looking at having an interactive tool that will allow community members to provide ideas about where our housing should be located. Um, we have 3,200 3, units that have been assigned to the city, um, meaning that we need to find a way to accommodate 3,200 units with the goal of ultimately um, having those units constructed within the city. So this tool will help us you know, we're, we're looking at where those sites might be, but we really feel like having community members participate in that process would be really useful. Um, and then I want to encourage you to either by email or uh, by participation to share your story. Um, we'll have a bunch of data that we'll, we're going to be collecting in the, in the coming months. Um, but the best data, I think, is just hearing from community members. Um, it's really helpful. Um, and just really briefly, some possible sites for uh, the, the accommodation of these units. We have the Northgate Redevelopment Project. Um, an application was submitted um, late last, uh, well, actually mid this year. <laughs> um, and we are evaluating that and um, how to potentially accommodate 1,300 units. Another location is Los Gamos, which would, could accommodate a, up to 192 units. And then there are a number of other projects that were um, you know, already approved by the city. And uh, we're just kind of waiting to see if we get permits. Um, so something I wanted to, Bonnie mentioned that, you know, there's sometimes a difficulty in trying to figure out who to contact at City Hall. Um, you know, you heard Chief mention how we are all very committed to providing public service and, you know, when, when Chief, or sorry, uh, Director Guerin gets an e a request or an email or a call or anybody on his team gets a call and it's not related to him, to that department, we hope that they will um, inform us, even if there's some cross you know, sometimes in, in our um, two organizations, um, there's cross um, issues that cross both departments and we're really great about um, communicating with each other. And so um, with, uh, with any, anything that you're interested in here in having resolved, um, please do, do reach out to either one of us. I'm happy to direct you to the right person. Um, however, I do wanna mention that there is a web, uh, a site in our, a website you, that you can go to. It's under our chief or director. I actually want to say chief director Garen's um, website. Um, it's called Report and Issue San Rafael. If you just type that into the search um, tab, that you'll you'll be able to find uh, you know who to contact depending on what you're interested in um, hearing about. So I heard the bell, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there and. Um, open it up to questions. Uh, one question dealing with what you just spoke to a moment ago uh, from a reader uh, attendee. Thank you all for being here this morning. Great information. Alicia, when will the process begin for taking public input, input on the housing element? That's a great question. So we are accepting comments now. <laughs> um, we had a, a kickoff meeting on Thursday and we expect to have our housing working group um, start in um, their meetings in January. Um, but you know, we are taking comments now via email um, and we'll be uploading information on our website, as I mentioned. Um, uh, the email, let me just re repeat the email address again so that you have that information. It's um, housing at sanrafel.org. What that'll do is you can submit your comments or just request to be informed of any upcoming meetings and, um, and we'll accommodate that. 
And then our website is sanrafaelhousing.org. And um, you'll be able to find useful information as we upload um, you know, data and statistics that we find. Um, if you want to provide your story, allow us to um, post it on our website. Um, that's where your story will be located. And like I mentioned earlier, we'll have a really cool tool. I'm really excited about this tool because I feel like, um, in my opinion, the more um, heads, the better and um, better to have community members share some ideas on where housing should be located because we really like we're looking at it and we we sometimes you think you solve a problem and somebody will go how about this and you go ah and so I think it would be a really great tool for community members to use and for us to receive that information so I encourage everybody to to use that thank you um it, I'm reminded by a couple of questions that um not everybody who's here really knows how the government works and what the various organizations are. Uh, could you just give a brief description of the Community Development Department and its role? Absolutely, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so community development is made up of um, historically uh, planning, uh, the building division, which handles all building permits um, and inspections of building permits applications yeah, during construction. Um, it's also made up of code enforcement. Code enforcement handles complaints. So if you have an issue with um, somebody building without permits or you know somebody's not maintaining their residence, um, noise, um, you know, somebody building outside of the scope of their permit, code enforcement would be who you would contact. Planning reviews all entitlement applications. So new applications for um, large developments, um, applications for um, a new single family home on a hillside lot. Um, some additions also require planning review and they essentially are managing the planning commission and the design review board. And then a new division that just um, was created because there's just a need um, as you all are very likely aware of. Um, the state has been very busy at um, handing down some um, housing legislation, really restricting our ability to, um, to regulate housing type of uh, types of projects. And so we're, it's really forcing us to just kind of constantly update our codes and um, our housing division, um, it was created as, out of necessity. And so it's ideal as well because the housing element update is now being um, kicked off. Um, there's a number of new, we, we go, the housing element gets updated every five years, every eight years. And it's, um, it's been generally kind of the same for a while. And now it's um, so much more <laughs> in depth and the state has, is requiring more information for us to provide in a, a more quick, quicker time frame. So, so hopefully that's, that helps. I'm afraid that we've run out of time. I really want to thank you uh, for, for your presentation. We have a couple of more questions and we just need to really move on uh, to our committee reports because we've had so much going on uh, that our hard working committees have been uh, busy with this past uh, year, this past six months, especially. So um, I want to thank you again uh, for your presentation. Uh, very informative. And we really uh, appreciate your being here and joining us and um, welcome you as our new de development director. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you. It was great being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to um, request that our uh, committee chairs join us so that uh, they can give reports. I see uh, Dave, Dave Crutcher um, uh, is here. Alan Shavitz is uh, also one of our committee chairs. Um, and other, other uh, chairs will be, will be um, coming on. But why don't we start uh, with Dave and have him give us the... Uh, Oh, and there's Winifred. Winifred is our um, wetland committee chair. Let's let's uh, let's uh, start off with uh, with the quarry committee chair's report. Uh, uh, 
Supervisor Connolly probably stole some of your thunder <laughs> by well, uh, filling folks in on uh, the great work that uh, the Quarry Committee has been doing. And, and uh, I want to recognize that there were a lot of people that were involved in this. And uh, Dave, why don't you tell everybody about what the Quarry Committee has been up to? Okay, I'll provide, thanks Bonnie, I'll provide a little more detail and context to what uh, Supervisor Connolly provided earlier on the recent agreement we've struck with the quarry. Um, it has been an eventful week. Uh, for several years, the quarry has had in front of the county an application to extend its operating permit another 20 years beyond the current 2024 permit expiration date, current as of last Monday anyway. Um, the extension requires an assessment of whether the quarry's reclamation plan continues to be adequate. And a reclamation plan, as we've said here in, in past meetings, um, is the plan for how the site will be cleaned up and put to use after mine, mining ceases and requires the quarry to perform some cleanup tasks before the mine shuts down. The application prompted an environmental review to determine whether the 2010 rec plan needed a new or supplemental environmental impact report, which is a pretty significant undertaking, or whether merely an addendum to the existing EIR, which is a much more abbreviated and expeditious process, um, was sufficient. Um, the county hired a consultant to review that question, and his review was completed in August. That The consultant concluded that the query's application was merely a request to keep doing what they've been doing, so no new environmental review was needed. On that basis, county staff recommended that the board approve the addendum to the rec plan and formally grant the permit extension. After the consultant's report was issued in August, the county invited the public to comment on the conclusion that the addendum to the rec plan was sufficient and that more extensive environmental analysis wasn't needed. And um, around 30 written comments were submitted, including comments by Marin Sierra Club, uh, Marin Audubon, Point Blue, Marin Conservation League, as well as individual residents who live in the area. For our part, we submitted our comments by letter on September 20. And our comments focused mainly on four topics, one of which was greenhouse gas emissions, which we got some agreement on from the consultant, and that will and that will result in some additional mitigation measures on that. And that left three other topics um, that we, we, we discussed in our letter. First, we, we've been disappointed in the condition of the marsh that separates the quarry operation from Point San Pedro Road. Though it looks more or less like a marsh today um, due to recent rains, of course it does because now we're talking about it. But for most of the year, it's, it's dry other than when it's been flushed out with seawater to control invasive species that don't belong in the marsh, which kind of gets to our basic complaint. The quarry was obligated to implement a marsh restoration plan as one of its permitting conditions. The plan it came up with wasn't much more than a plan to remove invasive species, which in our view falls well short of a restoration. Uh, the county, for its part, uncritically accepted that plan and did little over the years to see that even it was implemented. So what we're, we're left with is a marsh that contains no regular flow so that it's either bone dry much of the year or is in some putrid stage of drying out after a flushing. It does not support a, a vibrant fauna. And even though we're not, we're not marsh experts, um, um, but we do have a pretty strong sense that this marsh has been misserved and others who do have some expertise um, seem to agree with us. The second subject in our comment letter related to air quality testing. For a number of years, the quarry has been, um, I think maybe two years, has been testing air quality with some sophisticated equipment. And the results have suggested that quarry operations and reclamation occurring in late summer, as it has in the past couple of years, did not produce airborne particulate matter that was likely to be a significant risk to surrounding residents, at least not at this level of activity. Um, the quarry shut down that testing and the permit condition leaves it up to the county's discretion to require testing in the future. Um, the coalition has no particular problem with the lack of testing at current production levels, but current levels are about 25% of maximum and the quarry expects production levels to increase over the next decade as level, levee repair and sea level rise create um, more water accessible projects. 
And some of us at the coalition also are concerned that conditions have changed because of more frequent wildfires, which will piggyback even more particulate matter on top of quarry produced dust. We're not comfortable leaving it to the county to decide when to recommence air quality testing. We need more certainty on that, and such as a new operating condition uh, that requires testing when production levels and um, perhaps other uh, factors such as wildfires reach some specified level. Um, our third issue relates to road repair. Um, the permit contains a condition that the quarry will annually provide materials to the county for repairing Point San Pedro Road, which is a nod to the fact that quarry trucks uh, wear the road out much more quickly than if there wasn't a quarry. But the permit allowed the county to require the quarry to provide materials for a complete repaving of the road instead of providing materials, since presumably a repaved road doesn't need as much annual maintenance. That repaving was done somewhere around eight years ago or so. And at some point, it'll need to be redone or repaired. And the permit does not expressly say whether the quarry has any continuing obligation for road repair. Um, the quarry takes the position that the repaving project forever discharges its road, uh, its repair obligation. We take the position that its repair obligation was discharged through the expiration, uh, um, only um, through the expiration of the permit, which was in 2024. Um, we think we have a more sensible and even legally sound argument. Um, the, court, the county, for its part, hasn't really said which they agree with. So where are we? Well, on Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors approved the permit 20-year extension and approve the addendum, which relieves the quarry of any significant new environmental review. We're on record as opposing that extension unless there was further review. But in the past couple of weeks, um, we discussed our differences candidly with the quarry by meeting with them and putting the issues on the table. And the meetings went very well. And we made some good progress and we came to the following agreement. First, with regard to the marsh, the quarry has agreed to engage an expert for a second opinion on updating the current restoration plan to account for new technology and practices. We've agreed that the quarry will hire the expert from a list of three that, that we will propose. And we expect that this agreement will begin a process of determining what can practicably and economically be done to improve the vibrancy of the marsh. Um, second, the quarry has agreed that it's amenable to developing a plan that would determine when air monitoring and testing will be conducted by the county. We have some confidence that this, will, this agreement will, will yield some triggers that will require sophisticated air monitoring when future conditions warrant, such as when production increases. Finally, on our third concern about road repair, that's going to have to remain a work in progress. We, we could not bridge our differences on that, because partly because we ran out of time, but we've agreed to continue to discuss it, and we're hopeful that we can arrive at a compromise that'll keep the quarry involved and partly responsible for maintaining the road. So to wrap this up, the quarry got its 20-year extension, um, which we really had no good basis to oppose. And they got it without further substantial environmental review, which we had some basis to oppose, but that we instead traded in favor of getting query buy-in to address some of these outstanding marsh and air testing issues. So that's where we are. We're hopeful that this time next year, we'll have some good progress to report. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Great and detailed report. I hope uh, everybody is um, as pleased as I am with uh, the, the hard work that everybody put into making this happen. We all recognize the, that the uh, quarry is an important resource for our community and beyond, and um, we look forward to some productive discussions with them in the future and, and to collaborating with them. And they've really been very forthright in um, their discussions with us, and, and this has been great. We're, we're going to be me meeting with them more often than we did in the past and opening up communication lines further. So thank you. And um, I am mindful that we our time is limited. Um, I want to um, next ask uh, Winifred Dijani um, to, to take a moment to talk about the Wetlands Committee, which has just been doing great things uh, and collaborated a lot with the Quarry Committee with regard to the Quarry Wetlands. Um, but what else is going on with that with that committee, Winifred? We uh, are running out of time. So yeah, I, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to make it somewhat brief. Um, I am the chair of the wetlands committee and our mission is conservation and restoration of the wetlands along Point San Pedro corridor and part of that also includes education and advocacy so wetlands are amazingly complex ecozones 
And there's the obvious benefit we have when they're a thriving habitat of seeing this wonderful wildlife, but also their water filters, uh, their very, very efficient uh, carbon sequestration zones. Um, so, and they're wonderful open natural spaces that just improve the quality of people's life. And we're lucky we have five of them along this corridor, uh, China Campus I, that's a whole different uh, system there. Um, so our focus this year was really to learn more about these wetlands, different characters, their condition, what might we do to improve them. And this sort of offers some background over to what allowed us to come and give substantive uh, criticism regarding the current quarry marsh restoration. We had two field trips this year, uh, both of them with uh, environmental organizations, Marin Audubon, we had Barbara Salzman, we had uh, two individuals from Point Blue Science Conservation and someone from the Marin chapter of Sierra Club. And our main focus, of course, and you can't say this enough, is the 55 acre quarry wetlands that Dave talked about so well. So that's been our main focus because there's a lot of interest and concern by community members, especially those that view these wetlands on a daily basis. Uh, they just, there's a consensus, and this is shared by the environmental organizations, that there, there's much more that could be done to improve their condition. So as Dave said, based on all of that research, we were able to marshal all of that input from the going out on these field trips, have a better idea of where this restoration was falling short. And uh, this did result in members from the coalition on the board being able to sit down with the quarry responsibles and come to an agreement that the quarry, as Dave already said, will engage a wetlands restoration expert from a list of three provided by the coalition. So we're very encouraged by this collaboration and the quarry's willingness to work positively. And we're really enthused about moving forward and uh, getting this third opinion and getting engaged in seeing if maybe we can do something to enhance the quality of this. Now, regarding education, of course, uh, we have an amazing webinar coming up this Wednesday by bird expert Rick Cimino. And he's done webinars before. Next Wednesday, November 10th at 7, he is going to do a webinar on winter birds, majority of which will be ducks, but there's some other words that birds that come here from very far away. And they are birds in this neighborhood. So you will get like a custom tuned presentation about the birds that you see every day and understand more about them. And in addition to that, uh, we also had a great uh, webinar earlier this year called Wetlands 101. And that was hosted by Stuart Siegel, who gave a good overview of wetlands and Barbara Saltzman that zeroed in on each of these five wetlands and discussed their conditions and why each of them is unique. So we welcome anyone that wants to join the wetlands committee. So if helping protect and be good custodians of our natural resources is your passion, contact us through the SPR Coalition website. And thank you. Thank you, Winifred. Um, I, I'd like to move next um, to John Lenzer on disaster prep. We got lots going on there. John, welcome. And unmute, please. Oh, and before you uh, do that, I did just want to say very quickly, since Winifred mentioned uh, China Camp, um, there has been progress there. Uh, we, we, Katie Miller can't be here today to report on it, but um, the, she's our secretary and board member and our representative who's working uh, with other stakeholders interested in ensuring that the, uh, the roadway through China Camp uh, gets some improvements. That's our emergency egress in case of uh, disaster. And we we're very interested in that. It's a good segue into disaster prep, but also for environmental reasons. Anyway, a grant has been um, approved for studying what can be done there. So there's great progress on that front. More information is posted on our website. And um, so now, John, if you want to take it from here. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Uh, well, Point San Pedro Road and our communities are really in a, a very unique position. On one side, we have water, as we all know, and on the other side, we have uh, parks. Uh, wild uh, fires are part of 
of the uh, danger that we continue to live with, where potentially a fire could come out of China camp and come down into our neighborhoods. Um, if there was an earthquake, it's also very likely that we would not be able to exit through uh, either end of the road. Probably China camp would be closed and likewise there would be potentially, potentially liquefaction of portions of the road as we would go uh, west. So we're a community that needs to be able to be self-sufficient if we have a major uh, disaster, particularly in an earthquake situation. At any one moment in time, there's only uh, 23 uh, firemen um, and paramedics uh, that are available in all of San Rafael. We have two of them perhaps at engine uh, 55, station 55. But that's pretty much it. So we're on our own until outside resources can arrive. So uh, what does that really mean? And we've, we've been preparing for it. So last year, two years ago, we began raising funds uh, to buy emergency supplies. And we have received a grant of $4,000 from the county. We uh, raised another $8,000 locally. And we have been purchasing supplies which are being stored uh, here in our community uh, both medical supplies that would be available to uh, emergency workers here and also um, uh, earthquake type supplies that could be used by CERT uh, trained individuals in our community. We're coordinating with the, uh, uh, the uh, Marin Medical Reserve Corps. There's a lot of doctors that live in our area that could potentially come to a triage center and uh, help our community in case of a, of a major earthquake. So uh, at the present time, we're, we're buying a trailer in which these supplies will be stored where we can move that trailer at the time of a particular disaster to where it's needed most. Uh, and uh, that's, that's underway, the supplies have been purchased. Uh, Fire is, is an ongoing concern we have, and there's a lot of aspects of it. And the city is very involved in it, and the county very involved uh, with fire. So lots have been done on that. All of you in our community should have received a home inspection this summer by the fire department, telling uh, you what sort of vegetation should be removed or what you can do to make your homes more safe. Uh, we've had chipper days where if you took out, uh, um, you know, plants that were invasive or trees that were prone to fire, you could potentially uh, participate in a chipper day and, and have those taken away. Um, and uh, hopefully all of you have signed up for Fire Marin, uh, Alert Marin, so that you're notified if there's an emergency during the night or if you need to evacuate. And a lot has been done in the area of evacuations with a new program called Zone Haven, where our community has been divided up into evacuation zones so that you can be notified in a particular zone to evacuate. So all of these things are underway. Um, I would uh, encourage all of you to think about joining our committee if you have a concern with fire or earthquake uh, or flooding. Uh, and uh, we meet every other month. Uh, we'll also be raising additional funds for additional uh, supplies uh, in the spring. And uh, we'd love you to participate in that. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Unfortunately, we don't have time for a Q&A today. We still have more committee reports. Thank you, John, for your, um, for your report. Uh, this committee has been uh, doing great work uh, working with uh, com communities in our area that are, that are becoming firewise, um, encouraging uh, the uh, local uh, neighborhoods to organize uh, as neighborhood response groups. Um, you know, having weed pulls, doing all kinds of great things. And we had one in the spring, hopefully we'll have another one. And uh, it's just been a very, very active committee. So I, I agree with uh, John, it'd be great if um, even more people could join, they can uh, do that uh, through our website. Um, next, uh, I'm gonna ask Kevin Haggerty to give us the update on uh, roadway and medians, and uh, then we'll finish up with Alan's report on uh, Loch Lomond Marina. So hang in with us. I know we're at our 11 o'clock hour, uh, just a few minutes. If you can stay with us, we've got more, more of the report. So thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, the roadway committee has done work. Can you hear me? I don't. 
you can hear me? Okay, the roadway committee has done work in four areas. The first area is the Point San Pedro Road traffic and safety area. So we continue to work with the city and the county to identify uh, traffic, pedestrian crossing and other safety related issues. A couple of examples in those areas is we've worked with the city to improve signage at crosswalks. Um, and we're continuing to work with them to see if there are other things that we can do to improve safety uh, for pedestrians. We've also worked closely with the San Rafael Police Department to uh, increase enforcement of, for speeding. We've had complaints from residents and I'm happy to relate that they've been, they've been out there on a more regular basis uh, to minimize that problem. The second area is traffic congestion mitigation. So one of the things we've been doing is monitoring and providing input to Golden Gate Transit, who's the sponsor of the San Rafael Transit Center. Um, they've just completed the draft EA, EIR report. Um, we've all, we're also monitoring other city and Caltrans projects that affect uh, the Peninsula residents' ability to access downtown and the entrance to the freeway. A good example of that is the work that Caltrans is doing on the Central San Rafael Freeway. Again, you, you should have received notifications from the, the coalition regarding those, those closures. Uh, the third area is roadway medians. Um, we've continued to work with the city and their median maintenance contractor on, um, on their work on the medians. And I think the medians look pretty good right now. It's, it's taken a little while, but, but I think both the city and the maintenance contractor have done good work. We're also involved in working with the city to develop uh, recommendations for the annual assessment, median assessment fee. We, so we'll continue to do that next year. And finally, um, we've worked with the county staff to address some issues of design and parking related to the renovation of Bayside Park. And as Damon pointed out earlier, we'll continue to work with the city, with the county and the city and the community on uh, the possibility of a, a, a road diet trial. So expect to hear from us soon on, on that. So those are the four areas that our groups, the roadway committee has been working on. Thank you, Bonnie. Hey, thank you. And um, Alan Chavis is going to update us on the Loch Loman Marina Committee activities. Finally, at last, not just a disembodied voice asking questions. Um, the Marina Committee uh, of the coalition meets uh, every month with all of the participants that are involved in Loch Loman Marina. That's the city agencies, um, Alley's agency, for instance, uh, the CDD and also the Department of Public Works and all of the major owners and participants uh, involved. This, uh, we, and I produce a summary report that we put on the website every month. So if you wanna keep up with what's going on, I highly suggest you go to the website um, and take a look at those reports each month. Uh, this past year has been one, uh, if I can kind of uh, borrow from Dickens, um, not the best of times and the least, the least of times, but rather the least amount of work and the most amount of work uh, over this past year. Practically nothing has happened on the ground this past year. You probably noticed that. There's one exception I'll get to. Um, but a lot has happened behind the scenes. Um, over this past year, uh, Marina Village Associates, which is the major owner of all of the uh, property in this development, has sold off their ownerships. Uh, they first sold off all of the marina related portions uh, along the waterfront, the marina, the yacht club building, the uh, breakwater and connector to the breakwater, uh, and the launch ramps uh, are now owned by Safe Harbor Marinas, a worldwide, very highly respected marina owner and operator. Uh, they landed immediately, did work to start repairing the pilings on the marina, which had deteriorated to an alarming degree. There's much more yet to be done we'll talk about. The other part of the ownership was all of the undeveloped uh, residential areas in what's called the Strand. Uh, that was sold to Truemark Homes, a very well-known and respected uh, residential builder. Um, and a minor amount of work has happened there. What's been happening mostly is behind the scenes, going through the Bay uh, Conservation Development Corps, BCDC, 
this Army Corps of Engineers and the Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, giving them appro getting approvals from all of them of all the work that needed to be done. That has uh, gone a long way over this past year. Um, and we expect to see work beginning uh, pretty early next year um, on the housing, maybe e even as much as before the end of this year on the rest of the work that can be done, certainly after winter and high king tide areas are over. Uh, those will get started in, in the March uh, timeframe. So uh, if you want to know detailed status on things that are going on, the building side, a couple of questions were asked about when will the rest of the strand be built out. Uh, those plans are in their final stages of being approved by the city to approve to provide permits. In the interim, what th one thing that Trumark did do was to do all the, in a sense, underground work, bringing in the utilities and sewer and whatever to all the building sites. Um, they expect to get their permits to do the remainder. They'll start pouring foundations and, and do vert vertical building, uh, hopefully within the next month or two. Um, the breakwater flooding that happens there and on the playground uh, is almost done getting all the uh, approvals. It's gotten approval from BCDC and from the uh, uh, our Water Quality Control Board. Uh, what's left is the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, their approval that's expected to happen potentially this month, but the work on that can't start until after the winter season in King Tide. So it's expected to start in March or so of next year. Uh, we'll keep you informed on all the details as we have our meetings and on the website uh, report each month. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we say goodbye, I, there are a couple of questions or comments um, that we've received. And I, if you don't mind, I'd like to see if we can address both of them. Um, one is uh, from a member of the uh, Disaster Prep Committee. I know John didn't have time to say everything, um, but John, um, you know, you're you're storing a lot of things, but the commenter mentions that you are unable to store water, um, and that responsibility uh, lays with the individual households. Um, I am uh, hopeful that you can give some uh, information about what other things the homeowners or residents should do uh, to prepare, um, and, and you know maybe give a plug to the website for what what else is there yeah, in terms I, of I would say prepared. that that's that's really the case I don't think and we could we could talk for two hours about yeah. what <laughs> everyone really ought to be doing and there's so much to be done but I think the best uh, source of information really is the coalition's website if you go onto the website and you go to the disaster section there's lots of uh, worksheets and what have you as to what you ought to have in a in a go bag that you keep in your car, what you ought to have at home for, for supplies, what, how much water you should have, all those kinds of things. There's uh, you know, what you ought to be signing up for in terms of communication so that you're awakened in the middle of the night and can, can get out of your homes and, and evacuate should that be necessary. So rather than try to, to give a lecture about what people ought to do, please go to the website. Okay. read what's there and, food, and food. Uh, do it. For, okay, so food, water, all those kinds of things on our website and on our YouTube channel. We still have that two hour, the, the one hour to get ready. <laughs> so uh, you can watch a video about exactly what to do if you want, if you want to do that. So thank you um, for that. So remember, our, we have our YouTube channel under our resources on our website. Um, uh, there was, oh, we had another question. Uh, question or comment. I think, uh, Alan, uh, you went ahead and uh, answered that for the commenter. Uh, it was about uh, parking in the bike lanes. Um, so hopefully, I was going to ask uh, Kevin Haggerty to address that, but we are really out of time and have gone over. And I appreciate uh, so many of our attendees have stayed with us so they could hear these reports. I know everybody appreciates the hard work of our committee chairs and committee members and all, all of the uh, important uh, efforts on behalf of our community. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and uh, hope to see you around the neighborhood. Bye-bye.